I'm Bethany. I'm the founder, as he said, of Atypical. I'm also a researcher at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. I'm going to talk today about something that I deeply love, which is science fiction. So this is going to be very fun and hopefully inspiring. So why think and talk about science fiction right now? Because when we, when we like, ask these questions of like, what is the steady state going to look like in the future? What is AI going to be like as, as we like, live our lives instead of just these features? You know, we can look at science fiction and we can see these kind of like realities articulated that are pretty helpful to understand not only like what might be possible, but maybe what humanity actually wants. So, um, I actually used some AI as well to make this. So we scraped six million Goodreads and did kind of a, um, a knowledge graph with the concepts inside of science fiction. You can actually access the, um, the entire map at that URL. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause there while somebody takes a photo. <laughs> and when, when, you, when you look holistically at like what science fiction says about the future, you get this like really rich map of concepts and crazy worlds that you know, involve a lot of different things, not always education. I'm obviously going to focus more on the education part. So what are the paradigms from artificial intelligence that tell us how we will maybe be living and working and learning? Um, in the age of AI. So theme number one, no like surprise, but like augmentation, right? You know, software, hardware, we are kind of obsessed with taking our natural intelligence and extending that. There's some issues, obviously, like centralized control of assessment, probably not going to work. There's like ton, tons of stories about why this is going to like create um, issues, especially for differentiated learners and irreversibility. You need to be able to like reverse the augmentation. So if you're thinking about, you know, any sort of neural input, you, you have to consider that. Um, second, public-private interest in control of artificial intelligence. You know, we're at the air show, but when we're thinking about who controls the AI, there's not a lot of people talking about the end user controlling their own agent, right? We feel slightly more comfortable, perhaps, with OpenAI owning it than like a Google or a Microsoft, but we're kind of willing to like give all the data to them. Ultimately, I don't think that that's what like we want for the future. We want to have control of the agent that has all of our information. Deep fakes and truthiness. I mean, you're already seeing it happen. You know, OpenAI just launched Sora. You're seeing a ton of deep fakes on social media. This has like wide-ranging repercussions, not only for politics, but for education. Some of them could be good. You can you know, create doubles. But there's going to be this issue of truthiness that comes you know, not only with, with uh, high-stakes assessment, but also with knowing like, you know, who are you talking to. Um, in, a, in a bunch of books, especially like player games, you have this like, reversion to like, only humans in person end up being like the harbingers or like, the holders of truth. Um, and then, of course, community across borders. You know, uh, we're seeing this with the internet already, but you're gonna, when you think about localization, it shouldn't just be like the actual location. You'd be thinking about communities across borders, especially as they, as they gain power through like cryptocurrencies. Technologies we're likely to see develop. Obviously, ubiquitous augmented reality. Nexus and Feed are two of my favorite books that talk about this. Um, you're seeing this happen already, but, you know, to consider, there's going to be real issues when you've got ubiquitous like emotion detection, especially for like neurodivergent or diverse learners. So ponder that one. Um, e. Butler's Digital Twins. OK, the many different books, Neuromancer, Pandora Star is one of my favorite ones, because in that one, the users control all of their data. The code comes to them. And, you know, that, and, and there's just like this kind of personalized control of the agent. You've got like a whole host of issues that come with programming yourself deeply, cognitively, and emotionally into an agent, though. I've like listed some of them. Centralized high stakes assessment. This is a theme that we're all kind of like thinking about. But let me just call out two things. Too much personalization does create isolation. You need to have orchestration so that people can live together. And also, you need this concept of like redemption in, in like um, education. If we start gathering data about learners and then that data traps them into a future that they can't escape, even if they want to wake up one day and say, no, I'm going to be a different person, the technology is broken. The people will rebel against the system. Check out those games for, uh, 
for <laughs> some fun reads. And then spells, wands, and familiars. You know, when we, we, we've got like the internet of things, and it's very possible that we end up having these kind of like differential experiences based on our like biomarkers. So somebody might be able to take a unique device into a public or private space and get a different reaction from that space. You might be able to utter a certain phrase and get your environment to react differently than anybody else. So kind of preferential like access to, for example, this doesn't, this might sound crazy today, but there's a lot of examples of it, drone swarms or the ability to be erased from video feeds, et cetera. And then familiars. So obviously like this is kind of like a Harry Potter themed slide, but I find it quite joyful. You know, familiars, we, there's a lot of research around how people end up choosing like fuzzy, warm robots instead of like cold, hard ones for companionship. Um, so the marriage of embodied AI with like really strong conversational and emotional abilities is something we're likely to see. Part three, examples of education, schools, or learning paths that might actually work. All right. We should just all agree that human in the loops are better, and I just think that people that don't build with human in the loop at this stage like, need to like, you know, look, to the, look to all the books and just remember that it's very well established. Perhaps the most famous science fiction book that has ever talked about um, education is The Diamond Age, you know, the young lady's illustrated primer, where there's this really strong AI that teaches this you know, very disadvantaged girl at, like, to be the, you know, the best version of herself. But the thing that people forget about that book is the reason that her education was superior to anybody else's working with AI was because there was a human in the loop that actually cared about her. So when we think about you know, AI tutors and teaching assistants, there must be a default way for us to have a human in the loop if we have that available. I like to say, when a machine's better teachers, when there's no human. There's often a human, AI can help mediate that. Meditation, mentorship, and what I call bell curve teaching. You know, Dune just came out. That's lovely. It's been a really great book for a really long time. Maybe not all the later books, but definitely the first books. Um, but there's a bunch of lessons that we can take for what living with strong AI might look like or what it might require us to do. So for example, in Dune, you see Paul Atreides working not only with zero technology, but very high technology environments. And what I am pointing to here is you should not have an environment where everybody is dependent on AI for their learning. You need to have scenarios in their daily life where they are completely devoid of technology and they learn to like kind of work with and live with their like human biological body. So in, you know, in this book, Paul was well versed in meditation. He was well versed in like physical control. There was a lot of mindfulness in his education. And he could also access and use like high-powered tools like ornithopters and like all the other things that were out there. So I, I very much advocate for both of these things um, if we kind of want to retain our humanity as we live with AI. Um, mentorship, one of the other like critical factors of Paul's education was that he had very strong mentors, you know, like all of his friends. Now, one of the things I believe AI will uniquely help us do is match with mentors, right? You know, how do we find at the right time the right person that's gonna light up our neurons, that's gonna like light up our heart and actually help us like connect with learning. It's a, a unique thing that's gonna be made possible. Um, and so that kind of speaks to um, apprenticeship relationships as well. In summary, I cannot believe I've done this with time to spare, <laughs> it's amazing. But in summary, living with AI is going to involve augmentation, a struggle for control about who owns the AI, what its goals are, and who owns the compute. It's gonna involve deep fakes and a need to deal with truth across borders and in person. And it's gonna involve localization, communities that exist outside laws and boundaries that we previously knew. The next wave of tech that you're likely to see is obviously ubiquitous augmented reality, answers everywhere you go. It's gonna involve digital companions that go far beyond formal education where we control the data. 
It's going to have some centralized high stakes assessment, and we need to work very hard to make sure that that does not disadvantage learners, especially the divergent ones. And then Internet of Things magic, which will be potentially like incredibly fun and also like very scary for the people that don't have preferential access. And the scenarios that I think we should all kind of agree will exist or maybe should exist is that human in the loop is better. That integrating mentorships and meditation into our learning should be ubiquitous. And that having both high tech and zero tech pedagogy is gonna be a way to like retain our kind of humanity while we like augment our intelligence with these machines. That's my speech. Thank you so much.